So this is uh, what we talked about last time. Okay, uh, we said that there are two ways to overload a function, either a global function as a global function or a member function, but we said that in object-oriented programming we don't like we don't like um, a global function much, so we prefer uh, the member function overload of the operators. Uh, but in reality, unfortunately, we have to choose global global uh, operator overloading for some of the for some of the uh, operator overloading tasks, and uh, uh, we are going to talk about that uh, today. Under what conditions we will have to use the we will have to use the global functions. Okay, so we I looked at the I looked at the actually the sample program that overloaded uh, these one two three four uh, functions as a member function as constant functions. Okay, no problem with this. Let's go back to the slides and. Let's continue, and uh, we said that there are some special functions. Uh, it, I mean, it's not special, but all the operators are special, and they have their own rules, etc. If you like to overload this function application operator, okay, uh, such that, okay, you like to, uh, let's say, this is my class name, this is my object, so this is like money and M1, then you like to make a, you like to ma use this operator with this parameter, okay? So it could be it could be useful for some cases. For our money class, it doesn't make much sense. Okay, I mean, what does that mean? If, if M1 is a money object, what does that mean? M1 two doesn't mean much. Okay, of course I can overload it. I can print hello world in it. Doesn't mean much. It would be nonsense. It wouldn't be useful. So for the money class, maybe I shouldn't overload this, but if I have a string, if I have a string, okay, let's say it's a string one and it's, it is, it is initialized as, it is initialized as, okay, A, B, C, D, and string. And I think it would make sense to say things like, Starting from the second element, give me three characters. Okay. C out. So it would be element number zero, one, two, and unfortunately I don't have that many characters. Let's start. Okay. Starting from the second character, give me uh, just one character. So it's going to give me uh, which one? Uh, C, right? It's going to give me C. Okay. So I will print out C on the screen. So it makes sense for the string. And in fact, maybe for the standard SDL string, maybe I'm not sure about that, but uh, C++ SDL string. Okay, operator, do I have it? I don't have the index operator. Let's let's go to the the, uh, the documentation of the string class. Let's see if operator string. What kind of operators we uh, we have available for string operator? I don't have any operators. Did you did you guys see the index operator? No. What is, oh, this is something different. No, this is not string. String is here. Okay. This is a string. What is going on? Why am I keep getting this? Okay, this is my string. And inside the string, I don't see my regular stuff. Is it because these are the functions? Okay, here's the string class. 
These are some global functions, etc. So there is this assignment operator is available, of course. Index operator, modifiers, operations. No, unfortunately, no. That that operator uh, parentheses of the function call operator is not available for string. But as you remember, I think I did that. Yeah. So I define these two operators. I define these two operators uh, for the money class. One doesn't take any parameters. The other one takes two parameters. But I didn't implement them because I didn't know how to implement them. Doesn't make much sense. But if you like to, if you like to implement them in a non, non nonsensible way, you just, for example, return the summation of these three, two integers and one double, etc. So it is available. Uh, you can overload it. And the rules are, the rules are, it must be overloaded as a member function. You cannot overload the index of uh, the function call operator as a global, glo global function. It's the rule of the language system. Okay, so we talked about this. Let's move on. Other operators, other overloads. Of course, you can overload the, the, the and operator to ampersands and two pipe characters and the come operator, okay. Uh, the thing is, the thing is that when you overload them, okay, you lose this, you lose this property of short circuit evaluation. Remember short circuit evaluation? Short circuit evaluation says that this one will evaluate the left side first, and depending on the result, it is going to evaluate the right side. So these two or these three are doing the same thing. But if you overload them with your own types, for example, with the money again doesn't make, make the, doesn't make much sense with the money. If you overload them that way, you're gonna lose this uh, feature. Short circuit evaluation will not be short circuit evaluation will not be there at all. Okay, because I mean when you overload, remember when we overloaded the plus operator, it didn't return any integers or any doubles. It returned it returned our money objects, right? So if you overload this one, it doesn't have to return a boolean. What was the rule for this operator uh, as a logical operator? If the return value is true, then I evaluate the right side, right? So it depends that short circuit behavior depends on the return boolean uh, type value. Now, when I overload it, I don't have to return a boolean. So how does the short circuit evaluation work in that case? So that short circuit evaluation goes away and that doesn't work anymore. But generally, as I said before many times, okay, I mean, usually we don't touch these kind of operators in overloading. They are very specific operators. The, the, the most common operator to overload is which one? Which one do you think is the most common to overload? Assignment. Assignment usually if you need to, yeah, that's true. But usually these are the operators that you overload most of the time. Stream insertion and ex extraction, because I mean, for input output, they will be they will be necessary. Also the assignment operator, yes. Plus minus, yeah, they, that kind of makes sense, but I mean, usually, uh, I mean, for plus and minus to work, you need some numerical value or some kind of a string to add two strings together. Other than that, they will not make much uh, sense. So, and very rare operator like this one or that one or or the function call operator, they are they are they are really overloaded. Okay, so we said that for some reason, whatever we do, okay. We, we won't be able to escape from using the global functions, uh, global overloads, function overloads. And one problem with the global function overloads is that even though I like to make them my member functions, I cannot, okay? Remember, what was the example that I gave you last time? I told you that in this case, there is no way that you can overload that function as a member function. You have to use, for, uh, you have to use global function. What was the example? Thank you. 
Do, do you remember yesterday? I said that this function cannot be overloaded as a member function in our class. It has to be global function. What was that operator? It was in the last five minutes of the class. So you weren't here yesterday. You were at home, but you did you you, you weren't listening. What was the come on? Nobody's listening. I, I don't know what am I gonna do with you. Okay, I hope. Okay. Well take a guess then if you if you didn't listen. What kind of operators should definitely be overloaded as global functions? There is no other way. Equal. What? Equality? Equal. Assignment or equality? Equal. Well, we overload it as a member function and we compiled it many times for the money class, right? Didn't we do that? Yeah. Was that again? Stream insertion and extraction operators, right? Because for the stream insertion and extraction operators, you have to use it like this. See out money object, let's say, this one. As you see, on the left side, there is a see out object. Okay. On the right side, there is our money object. So they should read like this, maybe. See out dot operator stream insertion m1 right this is how the compiler sees it as a member function who wrote the class of c out what is the class of c out i even don't know what the class of c out is okay so how am i going to go into the class of c out and add this function i can't i don't have the source code okay so if I like to overload the stream insertion operator, then I have to, then I have to uh, choose the global functions, unfortunately. So that means that for some cases, in this case, I have to do it. For other cases, even though I could use the member functions, I prefer the global functions. Anyway, there is no, there is no avoiding of the, there is no avoiding of the global functions, so, uh, some would say that if I have to implement these global overloads, maybe they should access my private data too. So I'm making another compromise, okay, uh, from my uh, from my object-oriented programming principles. And I'm going to say that, and I'm going to say that, okay. I will declare a few global functions, okay, and these functions are my friends. They are called friend functions, okay? And um, those friend functions are free to access my private data or private functions. So they, they, although they are global functions, they have right to access my private data. They can behave like my regular uh, member functions, even though they are they are my they are they are my they are not my member functions. They are global, still they can access the private data. It's called, they are called friend functions, okay? So in my class, in my class definition, I say that these global functions are my friends. So they can do whatever they want with my data, okay? So that's what, we're, that's what we are gonna do. When we declare, when we declare global functions, global uh, uh, operator overload, I will tell the compiler that those overloads, even though they are global functions, they are my, they will be my friend functions, okay? So usually, this is what I do. If I have to, if I need to, if it is more efficient, make the operator overload as a global function and declare that global function as a friend of my class. Let's see one example. Okay. Here's the same mining class again. My nice constructors, my getter setters, etc. And these are the four things. 
okay friend function friend friend uh, uh, functions or friend operator overload I mean uh, friends they don't have to be always operator overloads any function can be your friend any global function or any function of another class could be your friend and in fact the whole other class another class could be your friend class we'll talk about it but in this case I will I will talk about uh, friend operator overload so as you see this line 19 this is a global function actually it takes two parameters binary plus operator remember our member operators our member operators take take only takes take only one parameter if they are binary and they take zero parameters if if they are unary but since this these four operators are going to be global functions they take for the binary two parameters for the unary one parameter and at the beginning I put this keyword this is a C++ keyword friend and I am telling that to the whole world to the compiler that these functions are, are my friends and they are free to access my private data and they are free to access my private functions so consider them as my as my uh, member functions you might say and the usage wise nothing is different equality operator plus operator minus operator and etc everything is there when you implement them okay you just implement the regular function that's it okay it's like a global function see operator plus is not a member of operator plus is not a member of the money class okay it's a global function but yet it says amount one that yeah, sends directly accesses the private data okay amount one dot dollars directly accesses the private data and uh, likewise for the minus operator binary minus binary equality operator and the unary minus operator okay good so this is what the friend means not that I don't put friend keyword in at the beginning of the at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the operator implementation okay this function doesn't say that I am a friend of that class okay friendship is not taken it is granted okay I grant you okay I grant you my friendship this class says okay you you don't you don't you don't get to say I am going to be a friend of this class okay this is your implementation and if that class declares you as a friend then you get to use its private data directly okay so it's kind of I mean from the beginning of the semester I keep telling you we don't like global functions yet now we have to write uh, global functions you might say okay and if if that is not enough i am violating another rule of object-oriented programming okay i am letting some global function to access i am letting a global function access my private data okay i i did two things two bad things at the same time in the same lecture so uh, we don't we are we are not proud of it as c plus plus programmers but this is the way the language is designed okay this is the way the language is designed there is no way around it and and from the beginning actually we had to have at least one global function like the main function if we didn't have the main function what would happen we wouldn't be compatible with the C programming language right we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be compa uh, uh, compatible with it uh, uh, so uh, we have to have at least one global function now we are talking about some other global functions if we are doing the operator overloading at least for the stream insertion and extraction okay stream insertion and extraction but some people still say that even though even though these four are uh, global functions okay as an object-oriented programmer I consider them as my member functions because I know that 
I, first of all, I am writing them. That's one thing. The second thing is that I, I know that they are going to access my private data because I, I let them, okay? I let them I, by writing this friend keyword. So it's kind of a controlled access. It's like a controlled access of the uh, private data from the global functions. So it is not like anybody can access my private data. Only the functions that I am allowing, that I am allowing, can I have access to private data. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you declare a friend function for something like C out? Like, uh, how should I uh, overlap a stream insertion operation for money? We are, we are going to see it in a few minutes. We are going to look at it. Okay, stream insertion and extraction, we are going to see how we are overloading it. I mean, it is, there is nothing magical about it. It's just the types and etc. But it, it cannot be our members. They cannot be our members. These pluses and minuses, they can be our members. This was a, just an example. But the stream insertion and extraction, they cannot be. Yes? And same function, the friend of different classes. Yeah, the same function can be friend of many different classes. All you need to do is you need to declare that global function as a friend in many of those classes. Okay. If I have a class A and class B, both of them could say that this function F is my friend. And in fact, as I said before, you may declare a member function of another class as your friend. Okay. A member function of another class as your friend. Or you may declare a whole other class as your friend. Okay, let's go back to the slides. We looked at this one. Okay, non-member functions. Um, so it says that best to make non-member non operator overload friends so that uh, they can have access to the private data and etc. And that, that, that way you are kind of saying that I know what I am doing. This is a global function. It looks like a global function. But I will take it as a member function, okay? I will take it as a member function. I will grant, uh, I will grant private data access privileges to that function. That's what we are saying. Okay, friend function of a class as a not as another member function has direct access to the private members. Okay, use the keyword friend in front of it. Again, they are not member function, but they can behave like member functions. Okay, so um, in operator overloads, we use friends. Other than the operator overloads, don't use friends, okay? Be very specific about using, be very careful about, cautious about using friend uh, functions, okay? Use it if you have to, okay? If there are no other way going around it, then you need to use friends. And I think operator overloading is, might be the only case you need to use friends. Other than the, other than that, if you keep using, if you make everybody your friend, okay, there is no information hiding then, right? Okay, information hiding is important. Don't let anybody access your uh, private data. That would be bad. So if you make everybody your friend, uh, if you make everybody your friend, then there is no information hiding. Okay. So, I mean, the friendship should be very carefully uh, uh, planned in object-oriented programming language. In real life, I mean, for some reason, in object-oriented programming languages, we talk relationships between class and functions using the relationships uh, that, that are valid for the humans, like the friendship and the inheritance and that kind of stuff. The friendship between two persons is very different than friendship between two uh, classes, one class, one function, etc. Okay, so we don't like friendship that much in object-oriented programming language. In real life, yeah, friendship is something nice. You need to have friends, you, you need to make lots of friends. Uh, but in object-oriented programming languages, okay, uh, uh, friendship is not good, okay? You don't, you, don't, you don't get friends unless you have to, okay? Uh, uh, you always try to communicate with the outside world with your public interface. Okay, most common uh, use of friends operator overloads. It improves efficiency 
and uh, when you do this operator overloading you, ha you don't have to use the accessor mutator of member functions but i don't i don't agree with it i mean even if you are writing a member function always use accessors and mutators but sometimes for some data members there is no accessor there is no mutator okay it is not available they didn't make it available in that case we have to access the data member directly okay good another important advantage of thread functions let's look at this definition remember what i did yesterday uh, i tried to add 25 to m2 and for that one i think i overloaded one more i added one more overload let me see if i can find it i think i change something did i change anything it was taking another where is it yeah i think it was this one was it do you guys remember where i put it this is i but did i did i implement it using the slides anyway can i compile this one let let me try to compile this one i hope i didn't change many things about it let me try to compile this one compile i hope it compiles but <laughs> where should i where should i see my output the window not that one tools compiler options not that one is it in execute i like to see the results of view maybe yeah report window i guess it is report window yeah did it yeah it compiled right am i compiling the right thing let me see if i am getting an error message yeah good okay so i am compiling the right thing okay so uh compile it good so i am going to write this one money um, m1 comma m2 comma m3 let's give some numbers to them get rid of this thing okay this is 10 and let's make this ten dollars and twenty cents and i have three money objects can i still compile it i wanna be make okay compile it. okay so m1 gets the value of m2 plus one okay so i'm going to add an integer to m1 m2 okay so yesterday i implemented this i guess on the slides i i wrote it by pen okay i didn't type it uh, to do this i have overloaded i have overloaded this plus operator that takes another that takes an integer right i think it was like this so i overloaded it as like this one will take an integer right this is what i did yesterday okay so when if i overload this one and if i overload it with doubles and shorts and etc it will work i say but surprise is this okay without overloading this without overloading this this one will work this one will compile let's compile it okay it compiles and there is no compilation error and it works okay 
let me get rid of these. Can I get rid of? Why not? Yeah. Yes. Let Let me get rid of these uh, dots, and all of them are going away. Okay. So maybe I can directly m m one that output, right? Okay, and I can compile and I can run. When I run it, where do I get it? Oh, okay, so it says 11.20, so M2 was 10.20, so 11.20, so it is calculating things right too. So how did this happen? What happened? I don't have any operators. I don't have any operators that will take a money and an integer. I didn't overload anything. This line is commented out. I just erase it. But it still works. How does it happen? This is how the compiler works. The compiler says that, okay, I'm seeing a plus operator here, okay? And what are the left side and right side? What are the parameters, the types of the parameters, okay? Money is here and integer there, okay? Are there any member operators or the global operator that takes a money and integer? No. Okay. But can I make, can I make, okay, there is a plus operator available here, but it takes two money objects. Okay. Two money objects. And it is inside the money class. Okay. So the left side is money, right side is not money. Can I make a money out of an integer? Compiler says, yes, I can. How? It is here. Okay. Line 13. There is a constructor, okay, there is a constructor that takes an integer and it takes a, it makes some money out of it. Okay, that takes a, that takes an integer and it makes a money out of it. So the compiler automatically will use this constructor. See, it's a conversion constructor, okay? It's a conversion constructor. It will take this uh, integer, it will feed it to this conversion constructor, it will make a money object out of it, and then it will use the plus operator available. Okay? So it is possible to write this and it is possible to write this too. Okay? Again, let's make this, why, why don't I, why don't I do this properly? And yeah, yes, that output, yeah, mm -hmm. so this one will print again uh, uh, 10, 11, 20, this one, and this one will do 11, 40, right? So both of them will work. Let me compile this one. The second one works because I have another constructor that takes a double, right? So that constructor, I mean, I have written it. I have written it. So it is because it was convenient to write such constructors, okay? A constructor that takes an integer, okay? Because I like to build a money out of an integer. And I like to build money out of a double. But the compiler is smart enough to use these kind of single parameter constructors. These are single parameter constructors as, as, Conversion constructors. Compiler does that. Okay? So I don't have to overload this plus operator for uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, different types where the plus makes kind of sense. So because plus makes kind of sense in this case, I am adding money with an integer or uh, maybe money with a double. So I have already the integer here and double there. So the con constructor is using those. Okay? If you don't like behavior, and if you if you think that this is sneaky, I mean, I didn't write this constructor to be used as a conversion constructor. You would say that this is not a conversion constructor. If you are going to use this constructor, use it use it explicitly. Okay. If you say explicit, this constructor is an explicit constructor. Okay. It will not be used automatically for, to convert something to convert. Uh, 
it will not be automatically used for converging from one element to one data type to another type. So this, the one that takes the double, okay, will not work now. I will get an error message here. Let me compile it. When I compile it, what happened? One, two, twenty. Didn't I save it? This is money double. Is it? Okay. Okay. Explicit. Okay. Save it. And compile it. So I say that many error messages, like how many, how many of them, I don't know. Uh, see this one, no, ma no match for operator plus. I cannot add this one, okay? And I think it's going to give me the same error message for the next line. But previously, what happened? If I, if I, if I erase this explicit here, I would expect to get an error message for one of them, not, not, but, but not for the others. Let's compile it again. Surprise, I am not getting any error messages. How come? I am not getting any error messages for this integer. I don't expect to get an error message for this double because it is not an explicit, but the integer construct is an explicit. How come I am not getting an error message for line 49? Um, compiler converted to an integer. Yeah, the compiler says that, okay, can I make a money object out of an integer? No, but there is a constructor that takes a double. An integer can be converted to a double, okay? So I am using this integer as a double now, uh, so I am going to use the other constructor, okay? I am going to use the other constructor. Let me get rid of this explicit. And let me let me try to do this actually. Uh, let's get rid of this stupid. S I don't need your help in writing parentheses. So how do I do this? Take this and do that, and I, I erase the wrong one. Okay, good. Again, the same thing dot output and get rid of this one and run this so it will say 11 20 and 11 20 both of them are 11 20 how come how come this is oh because this is m1 get rid of this one this is 120 and 120. Are they both using the same constructor? Where, where is it? Okay. Did I save them? Save it. And this is, let's say, 80. Okay, so the compiler might be using the same overload. The, the, the point is not that I am going to compile them at the same time. No, you did not compile just run. I did not compile it? No. Okay, I thought when you run it, it compiles and runs. Okay, compile it. Now run it. Okay, 11, 20, and okay, 90, 40. So double cost in const what what are these coming where are these coming from these are coming from these are coming from okay um this is this is from the this is from the constructor that takes an integer okay so okay the constructor that takes the constructor that takes an integer uh, constant, okay, and the constructor that takes a double, okay. So I print, I put these uh, print out statements so that 
I can see which constructor is being called. And in this case, it says, let me run it again. Let me run it again. Should I make them a little bit more readable by putting this, if I can find, where is my, okay, this is backslash n, and this is backslash n, right? Okay, so let's compile and let's run. Okay. Double, oh, okay, so I have double constructor, integer constructor and double constructor. So which one is coming from where? Let's go to the code. Okay, let's go to the code. Code is main. Okay. So this one is a double constructor. Again, this one is two, two constructor that takes. Why don't I get rid of this one and make it, okay, M3. This is M3 and M3. So I will get two messages then, right? Uh, there is a there is a you guys are tell, not telling me there is a compile and run option there okay so this integer constructor is called because I am doing this okay this integer constructor comes from line 49 and this double constructor here comes from line 50 Okay, it comes from line 50. Good, so uh, this one works. But, but, let's look at, okay, let me show you this one. Let me show you this one. And maybe I will just leave you with this during the break. Is this going to compile? Line 50? Why the compiler will try to think that can I make a one out of uh, uh, can I make a money out of one? If I can make it, uh, if I can make it, then this will work. And unfortunately, this will not compile. Unfortunately, this will not compile, and it will say what class operator uh, oper it. I don't know any operator that takes int int and money. Previously, I was doing money and int. Okay, this is now in term money. So you think about this. When we come back, we will talk about this, and we are trying to so try trying to address this problem. And unfortunately, we, uh, we will have to give up our idea of using the member functions, and we, are, we will have to switch the global functions to handle this problem. Okay, uh, 15 minutes of break. Let's be here. Let's be here around. 30, what 30, 10, 30. Yani konstruktörler eksplisit miydi? Efendim? Orada konstruktörler, konstruktörler eksplisit miydi? Eksplisit olsa kompan etmezdi ki. Eksplisit olsa da kompan etmezdi. Ya biz aynısını eksplisit olmadan yapmamış mıydık? Ben sanki öyle anladım da. 1 artı 25 şey mesela. 1 artı en bana bir şey atıyorduk. Orada yapıyordu. Öyle bir şey yapmadık hiç. 1 artı yapmadık. M artı 1 yapmadık. Özellikle dikkat ettim ben buna. M artı 1'di. 1 artı M değildi.
Glasses. Do you know how many glasses I carry? Four, five. Four or five, yeah. So what's going on here? So let's see the code again. When the compiler sees this one, it says that M3 is a money object. So let me go to the money class. Are there any are there any functions that takes a uh, money and a plus operator? Yeah, it, here it is. Okay, uh, but unfortunately, the second side, the left side, the right side has to be a money object again. 
with an integer. Can I make a uh, money out of an integer? Yes, it is here. It works. But when the compiler says this one, this is an integer class, I don't see any global function that takes an integer and a uh, money object. If I go to the integer class, I don't see any uh, plus operator, member plus operator inside the integer class that uh, that takes a money or there are no integer constructor that changes that co that that converts a, that converts a money to an integer. So this will not work. Okay. So unfortunately, for this to work, I need to have I need to have a global plus operator that will take two money objects. Okay. With this global uh, operator with two objects. Okay, uh, uh, the compiler will try to convert either this one or that one to the to the uh, uh, to the money objects. Let's go to the friend. Dev. Okay, here here they are the friend ones, right? Let me just paste this, paste this here, and yeah, and I don't have an M three, and let me make it my amount and compile it. I am not going to run it. I hope I didn't make many other changes. See it compile. Okay. So it will this one will compile and this one will compile too. Plus three point six point six. Okay. The, the only difference is that one of them is a global function, the other one is a member function. Okay. Uh, when I'm saying this, I am really sorry about this, but I mean, this is how it works. Okay. So remember, at the beginning of the at the beginning of the operator overloading chapter, let me go to the original slide, slide number one. Oh, I compile. Okay. So I, we, we, it's gone now. We said that if there is a statement like this A plus B, the compiler will see it as like either a global function, operator plus A comma B, or A dot operator plus B. Mm -hmm. That was the whole idea, right? That was the whole thing. And we are not going away from this idea. That's it. Uh, what 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 does it say? My, can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, my voice is breaking up, or the, there is a problem with the synchronization? No, right? Okay, good. Oh, it's sir. So if 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 there is a problem, just let me know. Maybe I can turn off my camera or do something. I don't know. So, I mean, that was the whole idea, but after I introduced it, I, I, we said that we, we, we are going to, we are going to overload this function, we are going to overload this function, or uh, the other function, after doing that, after doing that, okay, we had to deal with lots of Compiler and language complications. Okay, knowing something, knowing the theory is something, and doing it in practice is something else. Okay, and if you are not good at both of them, both theory and uh, practice, nobody will pay you anything. Okay, I mean, if you if you know the theory very well, nobody is going to pay you. Your boss will not pay you. This this engineer knows lots of object-oriented stuff, very good theory, and I said no. If you are good at the practice only, if you don't know what you are doing, okay, they will pay you only small amounts of money because you don't know what you are doing, actually. You are just like a blue-colored uh, worker, okay? You are doing whatever you are told. You cannot design. You cannot think uh, about the bigger picture. You, you, you don't know where you are going, actually. People are telling you something and you are doing programming, and that's what, what, is, what it will be. But if you know both of, both of them, what object-oriented programming is, what is it, what is it good for, and how to how to how to code using those uh, principles, then you you become uh, valuable, and you can build on top of it. I am not saying that once you know both of them, 
what of the credit programming uh, you are a good programming you are done i am not saying that okay you are just second year students here right and you will have to take this software engineering course programming languages course you don't know how to design algorithms yet you don't know how to analyze algorithms yet you can build on top of it if you don't know the theory of these kind of stuff you just become uh, maybe a, a nice programmer and that that would be that would be it uh, th that doesn't mean that you wouldn't find any jobs yes yeah we yes, you would but there is a there is a potential barrier do you, you cannot you cannot uh, uh, move above and that would be a kind of waste of career actually so uh, be careful about both sides try to understand what we are trying to tell you here like the like the like the <laughs> this guy is funny where is that let me find it he is very he is very Where is it? Where is it? I, I couldn't find it. Which one? It was talking about the theory of it, about the memorization. Yeah, I can, this one. Okay. So he says that, evladım yere kürerin ezberlemeyin. So th that's what I'm saying. Okay, you re you read this later. Okay, let me go back friend functions and we talk about this one. So we need friends, unfortunately, both for sometimes we have to stream insertion extraction and sometimes it is good for it is good for uh, making this kind of code compile and making this kind of code compile. Otherwise, if I am if I if I wanted to comp uh, make this compile okay using the conversion constructors yeah but this one doesn't compile with the even with the conversion constructors so you have to go to the you have to go to the um, friend functions unfortunately because there is no other way that you can compile this okay good any other que any questions any questions How many people have pens with them? How many? One, two. Half of you? Okay. The one of the nicest things about this COVID th thing is that people forget about their pens and pencils. Now we have much cleaner desks. Nobody's writing on the desks anymore or the walls. So these are the positive stuff. Okay. No, no questions? Okay, I will move on. I feel weird. I mean, when I'm talking to you, I am making a joke here. Nobody is laughing. Okay, I will, I will go on. So friends, we don't like friends in C++. That's, 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 the, that's the way to put it. Okay, unfortunately, you will say, we don't like friends because they are against the rules of object-oriented programming. Okay, in real life, we like, we like friends a lot. Uh, as human beings, we like friends. But in, in, in C++, we don't like friends. Don't use them unless you have to. And I showed you two cases where you need to use the friends. Stream insertion and that kind of uh, uh, 25 plus money kind of stuff, okay? Sometimes it, is, it has advantages for operators, okay? Automatic type conversion with friends makes lots of uh, statements possible, okay? Sometimes it improves efficiency. And sometimes for the classes that we don't own, okay, we have to use we have to use friends. So that's that's it, okay. As I said before, uh, classes can be friends. Class F is a friend of class C. You could say that, and this is how you do it actually. Okay, this is my class definition. Class C. Class C says that there is a class named F. There is a class named F. It's my friend, okay. And then I declare my class F here. Okay. If I don't put this forward declaration, class declaration, at this line, okay, when I put this line, the compiler will say that what is F? I don't know anything about F. By saying this, I am saying that there will be a class declaration F coming. For now, you need to know about the name of the class only. So class F, forward declaration in class C, you say that. 
Remember, uh, I, I told you that there is a class F. That class is my friend. And then I have the class declaration here. So this is how you declare a, 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 a class, a whole class, your friend. Again, friendship is not taken. You don't say, you don't say, I am a friend of that class, OK? That class says that this guy is my friend. So C says that F is my friend, OK? F doesn't say, I am a friend of C. Okay, so friendship is granted, not taken. Friendship is granted, not taken. Okay, so this class, whole class F becomes a friend of class C. What does that mean? All the functions of class F public private functions, they get to access the private fields of class C. Okay? Yeah. Uh, in this situation, uh, just C uh, access the F private section or both of them? Can both of them. Well, uh, you, maybe you are asking this. Does it matter to include this in the public section or the private section? No. Anywhere in, the, in your class declaration, Okay, you put this line and it works. Okay, so if somebody becomes your friend, then that means that that, that person, that function, that class can behave like your regular member functions. Anybody has any questions from the online audience? No. Okay, I will continue then. Um, again, we don't like this. I mean, if you are doing such a thing, if you are doing such a thing, that means that probably you should consider that this class C and F are the same class, maybe. Okay? Why don't you make them the same class? Right? Why don't you make them the same class? Because one of them is a uh, friend of F. Or maybe better yet, make this class F an inner class of C. Okay, if I make this class F and a class of C, then everything would be without using the friendship uh, within the rules of the object oriented programming, you would solve this problem. So, always, if you are doing about some friends, if you are doing about something about the global functions, try to think about solving the same problem using object oriented programming rules. And uh, maybe at the beginning, you will spend some time, but uh, uh, you won't be sorry at the end because. Always trying to develop, always trying to develop nicely designed software is a nice practice. Okay, all types of engineers they spend lots of time in designing stuff. Do you know how many years does it take to design an airport? It takes three or four years just to design it on the paper, without without starting anything, without moving any single stone, right? So once you do it, once you do it, once you design everything. After that, you start building it. So uh, uh, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't make changes in your uh, uh, construction later. Okay, you you design it right. So with the software, we try to do the same thing. But to understand if the ideas work, we write small programs. Once once we write small programs, prototypes. Once you understand how the things work, we we rewrite the whole thing again uh, with our uh, uh, new with our new. Uh, uh, experience that we get from the prototype code. Okay, so some people just write the prototype code and that's it. That that would be a wrong thing. Yeah. I can't access a uh, member of function f in C with that way. Uh, can I access member of function C in class F without uh, friend class C in class B? Well, again, friendship is not symmetric. Okay, it is granted, not taken. F is a friend of C. C is not a friend of F. Okay, if you like to make C a friend of F, then inside here you need to say C is my friend. Okay, yeah. Uh, we say F is friend of C, and uh, what if we wanna hide from uh, C? Uh, mm -hmm. 
some part of your class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of uh, part you are going to hide? Private part? Private if you are going to hide the private part, then uh, it becomes just another class then, right? Because nobody has access to your private part. Part the part is accessible for everybody. So you either you either somebody is in or out. That's it. There are no levels of access privileges in C++ or in object oriented programming language. There is a small exception for that when we come to the inheritance, but no. I mean. That's not a good idea. I mean, it seems like a good idea. Why don't we have access levels? I mean, access level number uh, level one, two, two, three, etc. Well, that idea doesn't fly. That doesn't work. Okay, that makes it very complicated to think, to design, to implement stuff. So there are two access levels: public and private. That's it for the outside world. Okay, some rules for the operator overloading. Okay, I showed you this yesterday. Okay, so you have to memorize this. If you are overloading global function or the member function, one of the parameters should definitely be a non-fundamental type. Uh, you cannot overload, you cannot overload uh, operator plus int and int. You are saying that I am going to overload the plus operators for the integers, right? No, this is wrong. You can't do that, okay? What does the rule say? Say that one of the, one of the parameters, okay, should be, should be non-fundamental type. It should be money or bank account or grade book or string or whatever, okay? You can't. You cannot overload. You cannot change the meaning of the plus operators for the integers or the doubles or the characters. Okay, so that's one of the rules. Most operators can be overloaded as member of a class, a friend of a class, or a non-member, a non-friend. But there are some exceptions. The following operators can be oper uh, overloaded as uh, members of the class. Okay, assignment operator, index operator, error operator and function call operator. These four have to be implemented as a member function, have to be overloaded as a member function. Okay? Another rule, okay? You cannot create a new operator. Okay, you cannot create a new operator. I like this add sign. Okay, so I that, that would be very nice if I have two money objects and I am going to overload this add sign so that this makes a new operator. No, you cannot, okay? If the operator is available in C, C++, then we'll overload it. If it is not available, you don't invent, you don't introduce a new operator. This is not operator definition. This is operator overloading, okay? That operator has to be there. You, you give a new meaning to it, okay? And the other thing is that, other thing is that, this is not possible, other thing is that you cannot change the number of arguments that an operator takes, okay? Plus is a binary and unary. That's why you will say money one, money one plus money two, or plus money two. Why? Because plus can be both unary and binary, okay? Unary and binary. Uh, you could say money one times money two, you could say money two, you could say that, right? Is that true? Star money two? Because star can be a binary and unary, remember? We use star as a dereferencing operator, right? Um, you could do m1 over m2, but you cannot do slash m2, because slash has to be a Slash has to be a, a, this one, slash has to be a binary operator. There is no unary slash, right? So you cannot change the number of arguments. And uh, on top of it, you cannot change the precedence. Plus is always done after multiplication. Star. Okay, let's say I overloaded, I overloaded, 
the 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 class operator and the star operator for money this one will be definitely done first it, its presence is higher okay uh, some of the operators cannot be overloaded the dot operator when you say m1 dot get sent it's an operator right function call operator so it cannot be overloaded binary scope resolution operator is not cannot be overloaded size of operator cannot be overloaded ternary condition operator cannot be overloaded and the dot star operator which is a brother of the error operator actually they cannot be overloaded okay and i think this is understandable an overload operator cannot have default arguments that would be funny right it's like saying saying something like this where is my yeah so uh it's like saying something like okay if if nobody gives me any money then take the default money objects and so you can't say that for a you can say that for a um for a for a for a plus operator because if you are using plus you have to provide both parameters right and what is the meaning of the default arguments you can skip giving the uh, uh, step of giving the arguments now you have to do this this is a compiler error okay good what does it do when i try to compile this one why am i getting so many errors it say that yeah operator plus cannot have default arguments well exactly what the book says nothing interesting where did it go oh, okay good my parentheses my parentheses good uh, what else yeah that's it i guess there will be there will be some other there will be some other rules again at the end of this lecture uh, at the end of this chapter and we are going to see it there okay so read the book operator overloading book uh, carefully very carefully although this whole operator overloading again i am now i am telling it maybe the seventh time okay it's all about this just this one okay there are many details and those details are important important because without knowing those details you cannot write proper oper operator overloading code also those details are important uh, because you get to understand c plus plus or object oriented programming better okay we i mean I'm, i i've been talking about the object oriented privates and public and friends and their advantages disadvantages etc so that's why we like talking about operator overloading so let's go back to references a little bit we talked about the references we use the references for the call by reference type of function calling and uh, i think somebody asked about this can we use the references in other places yes the answer is yes other than the function calling uh, you could use references like this let's say i have a integer named robert okay you could say that i have an integer reference this will be a reference to this integer robert his name is bob you know as you know the americans they use the robert and bob uh, to refer to the same person robert and bob mostly uh, is the same name okay so if you change robert the value of bob will change and if you change bob the value of robert will change so this is the same idea so when you make a function call with a reference okay your function parameter becomes a reference to your argument right so if i have a function in function that takes a let's say a double reference d and i am calling this function let's say double my double 10.20 
And I'm calling this function with this my double, okay? This D becomes a reference to this my double, okay? When you are doing this function calling, that's what's happening. So here, Bob becomes a reference to Robert. So this is a reference assignment. And during the lifetime of a reference, reference assignment is done only once. Later, because when I say later, when I say Bob gets the value of, let's say, i. i is another integer. So this is a regular integer assignment. It's a regular integer assignment. It is not a reference assignment. This is the reference initialization, and this is the integer assignment. When you declare references like this, you have to initialize it. You cannot leave this part empty. It has to be initialized. Okay. This is another way to use the references. Obviously, quite useless example, this one. Why would I have another name for an integer? I already have a name for this integer. Why would I need another name? That doesn't make any sense. So nobody uses the references this way. So where, we, where do we use the references? One thing is, I use the reference to do the pass by reference mechanism. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is that I use references uh, as, as function return types. From the function, sometimes I would return a reference, and that would be a lot useful, OK? For example, if this guy is returning, if this guy is returning a double reference, OK? And let me implement this function, actually. I am implementing this function as return d. So I took a reference to a double, and I am returning a d. So but d is returned as a reference. So I am returning a reference to d, but d is a reference to my d. Okay. So when you do this, you can do stuff like f my d gets the value of seventeen point two. So in effect. I am assigning the value of 17.2 to, to, to this my d double. OK? So I took a reference, and I re returned it as a reference. OK? I returned it as a reference, and I am doing this assignment. These references, <coughs> these references, they behave like L values, OK? They can be L values. But if I just erase this one, what would happen? What would happen if I erase this one? Compiler gives an error when Compiler gives an error message where? Uh, assignment of F and Yeah. Compiler says that this value cannot be F my D cannot be a L value, right? It is it can be an only R value. When I do this. Now it can be a both L value and R value. So why are we talking about this? Because we are going to use this feature to overload the index operator. Because with the index operator, let's say, um, with the index operator, let's say, money object zero. Let's say this is a very stupid implementation overloading of the money index operator. Let's say. Money zero means it is the dollars part, and money one means the cents part, OK? So when I do this, maybe if I return a reference to the dollars part, I can make an assignment 7, and I can make an assignment 20. Right? So I can do that kind of stuff. So I am returning a reference to one of my private data. And everybody uh, who can get that reference can change my private data, which is stupid because I am exposing my private data to the outside world. OK, I'm exposing my data to the outside world, which shouldn't be done, actually. But if you, if you like to, you can do it. Usually, I don't use index operator for these kind of cases. Where do we use the index operator? We use the index operator for, for, for stuff like vectors, like strings, right? So index operator doesn't make much sense for the money class. But if you like to overload it, yeah, you could overload it. 
Okay, so th that's what we are going to do. So uh, let me show you. We already did that, okay? L values and R values we know, okay? Uh, there are L values and assignment operator and there are R values, okay? L value is, your, is used for something that can appear on the left hand side of an assignment operator and the R value is uh, similar, only the things that can, that can happen on the right side, okay? And if you, if you want the object returned by a function to be an L value, like the index operator, okay? it must be returned by a reference, otherwise it cannot behave like an L value. And, uh, yeah. Let me show you one example of this L value, R value thing. If I have it, do I have it? What is this? These are the friends. And these are the, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about, can I do it here? These are my, yeah, this is good, yes. Let's say I have a class named character page. Very simple class. I have two private data members, first and second. So I am keeping just two characters inside my objects of uh, character pair. So it's like A comma B kind of thing, okay? So no parameter constructor, doesn't do anything, doesn't initialize anything. It's a bad constructor because it keeps these, these, these two data members uninitialized. That's a bad thing. The second one, the second one say that I will get two characters and I will assign them using the initialization section to the first and second, okay? And then I have this index operator. See, the index operator, which will take an integer as an index, and it will return a character reference. And this is how I'm going to use it, you see? Character pair A, A1 is A, and A2 is B. And when I print them out, it will be like this, okay? Print A1 and A2. It looks like A1 is going to be first and A2 is going to be second, okay? And I can change their values. I can change their values the way I want. I can access them the, the way I want, okay? I can use them in a C in statement, C out statement, whatever you want. You might say that this is pretty dangerous. I mean, I mean, you are letting everybody, you are letting everybody change your private data, that's true. I don't like this, but this is just an example to show you how the index operator works. Usually for this kind of mechanism, we use the setters, right? And setters have to make sure that whatever I am inputting is a valid value. In this case, I guess all kinds of characters are valid for the first and second. That's why maybe I allowed it. Let's look at the implementation. Implementation is just this, very simple, very simple. Let me get rid of this. Okay, so you say that take the index, take the index, okay. If index is one, return first. If index is two, return second, okay. First and second, remember my data members, okay, private data members. I return either first or second, and since I am returning them as reference, then, then I could use whatever is returned from this uh, operator as an L value. Okay, so that's the, how usually you overload the index operators. Okay, good, any questions? Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Okay. I think a well-defined function is uh, better in any 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 term than uh, operator overloading. So, sh should we choose over uh, should we choose uh, function over functions over uh, operator overloading always? Well, uh, at the beginning of the chapter, as actually, I mean, 
Without the operator overloading, C++ is still a nice language. We don't have to use operator overloading at all. Okay? And in fact, they didn't have to, they didn't have to, they didn't have to make it available for you, the plus uh, 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 infix notation, like in C, you write this and you immediately understand that it's addition of two integers, right? Instead of giving you this, they could have defined an operator plus function, and it would take two parameters. That's it, right? So I could have done this. So you don't need any operators, actually. The functions are fine. But writing this kind of code makes your code more readable, readable sometimes. Okay? Should you write it this way or that way? It is up to you. Which one is easier for the reader to read your program? You are going to make that decision. Okay? Usually, we don't overload that many operators in our code. Maybe 5% of all the functions that you write are operator overload. Usually, we write regular functions. Yeah, that's true. What you are saying is, I, I mean, as long as you are careful about the usage, how the customer feels about it, it makes his job easy, then use it. For example, index operator is very nice for the vectors, but as I, as let's say I have a vector V, okay, and writing this is very convenient. We have been doing this, but vector has another function. It is at, okay, and this is possible too. Okay, so it is the exactly the same thing. It behaves a little bit different. It does the range checking too. I mean, if the index is smaller than zero and it is larger than the size, it warns you or it, it, it terminates your program, etc. But you don't have to use any, you don't have to use any operators or most of the operators. Functions would have been fine, but I mean. People prefer line 32 over line 33. It is easier to uh, it is easier to read line 23, uh, 32. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yes, madam. Okay. So let's go back to this one. And question for you. Should I make this const or not? Well, that's a difficult question. Should I make this a const or not? If I make this a const, well, it looks like I am not changing anything inside this implementation. If I make this a const, if I make this a const, what happens? I am not changing first, I am not changing second, but, okay, fill in the part, what is, what, what am I, what, 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 uh, what, uh, tell me what I am concerned about. If I make this a const, yeah. Electrons can change. Uh, well, if I make the const, and if I return a reference to my first, people are going to change it, right? So that's not right. I mean, even though I am not changing anything in my in my in my function, I am letting anybody uh, who has access to this indexing operator change my internal value. And in fact, this will not compile. When I try to compile it, it will say what? Tell me what it says. Where will I get? Uh, okay, you got it. Yeah, it says that. You cannot, you cannot return a non-const reference from a count function, okay? What does it say? Invalid initialization of reference type care from expression of top const character. So you are saying that this function is a const, but you are returning first as a non-const. So I have to do this to const, const, uh, okay? So let me do the same thing here too. Uh, so how about now? 
is my code going to be happy? No. Line number 22. Line number 22 will be in trouble. It will say, it will say, well, A1 is returning a constant reference and you are trying to modify it. Line 22 is bad. So what am I going to do now? I mean, if I remove these two lines, if I remove these two lines, this will be fine, this will be fine. This line will not be fine, right? So let me try to compile it. So I am fine now, I compiled and linked. But if I like to use this, I mean, as an R value, this, fi this works fine. As an R value, this one works fine. But as an L value, it doesn't work. So should I make this, okay, should I take this uh, away? Or should I keep it? Maybe you, you maybe you will say that, yeah, just get rid of it. Everything works fine then, right? Everything works fine if I get rid of it. If I get rid of it. But, okay, let's do that. In fact, let me make this, let me make a copy of it and take it out. And now this one, now this one will work. Can I do this? Oh, no. How do I take the comments out? Do I have anything other than that? Yeah, okay, there is one more. There is one more. I took it out and I can compile it now. Let me, why don't I use F9? I compiled it. What, what does it say? Yeah, maybe I should. Get rid of this one. Get rid of this one. And that. And F9. Compile that, compiles fine. So you, you, might be, you, you might be saying, oh, well, we are fine. Why are we talking about the constant, that kind of stuff? But no, this, pro this code has a very serious problem. It is missing something. You might say that if I return a non-const, then I could be, it could be there's an L value and an R value too. But what if I have a const card pair like CP, okay? And its values are, no, oh, it works, okay. Q and R, okay. I have a const CP, okay. And I like to print it out like using a one, no, not a one, CP one. Do you think this will compile? No. Why? CP is a const object. Index operator is a non-const uh, operator. If I try to compile this, I will get an error message here. It says that const character pair as this argument of this card qualifier something something. Okay. So you are talking about the constants and you are using it. Okay. I mean, index operator, index operator works only on the non-const objects. It, it cannot work on the... So what am I going to do? This is what I'm going to do. This is kind of, kind, of, kind of confusing, but not much, maybe. So I will define both of them. Overload it. Okay? Both of them are returning character references. Both of them uh, are taking an index, but their signatures are different. Why? Because the upper one is a const function. So constness changes the signature. Okay? Constness changes the signature. So what am I, how am I going to implement this? How am I going to implement this function then? It will be implemented, unfortunately, I keep calling, using that word today a lot, but these are the facts of life. I, I, I don't know. I didn't implement this. I didn't invent this language. Unfortunately, it will be exactly the same. If index one is one, then return a constant reference. 
If index is 2, then return a constant reference to second. Okay? And the compiler is smart enough to, to, to call the correct signature uh, overload. It compiles, I guess, yeah, it compiles and it's going to run. Okay? So you could say, how, how could this happen? How could this be at the same time we are doing this and that? Yeah, well, that's, the, that's how it works. Good? Oh, okay, I'm out of time. Any questions? So this is, this is important. I mean, I mean, this index operator, of course, it's an index operator, but I didn't talk about the index operator for the last 10 minutes. I talked about returning a reference from a function and returning a constant reference from a function. The signatures of these two, line 13 and 14, are different. It is not because what they are returning, because remember, return types is not inside the signature of a function. It is only the parameters and the name. So the parameters, you might say, well, it is the same thing. Uh, they are both integers. No, this one is a constant uh, uh, function. Say that I'm not going to modify the object I am taking. And in, in this case, compiler, can I, can I run this? Just execute it, compiler on F11. I compile it and run it. So it says QA, what? Oh, okay, QA comes from the, QA comes from the first, uh, uh, first my printout from the constant object, and the others come from the, uh, uh, the, the co code of the book. So this one, maybe I should say, okay, and backslash and here, okay, and I'm going to do something that will let us see the difference. Okay, this is const index, and this will be non-const index. Let's go to this, okay. Let me copy this and print this A. Well, I don't know what it is going. Well, it's going to print some junk value. Why don't I do this then? Okay. So, and get rid of the rest so that I don't see them. Okay, F11. What does it say? Cannot open output file because, oh, okay, my program is still running. My program is still running. Okay, F11 now. So let's look at this one then. Okay, so the first one a1 gets a index operator. So I, I called index operator three times. One, two, three. This comes from the first one, non-const index. This one comes from the const index, and q is printed. And this one, again, comes from the non-const index, and a is printed. OK? So it knows which one to call, two different index operators. OK? So that's it. If there are no questions, I will stop here, and we will continue tomorrow morning. We will, we will finish up with the chapter. I didn't cover the stream insertion extraction yet. And since you have your, your, your midterm exam on Monday, please come back with your questions tomorrow. Ask me your questions, whatever question you might have. I will try to answer them about the whole uh, eight chapters that we covered so far. 
And, and if you don't have any questions tomorrow, I will start a new chapter. I will, I will never stop. By the way, on Monday we have a lecture too. Okay? On Monday morning we have a lecture during the, and after, uh, 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 the, 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 uh, after the lecture at uh, 5.30 p.m. we will have our midterm exam. Everybody knows that the midterm exam will be face to face, right? You are not assuming that it will be it will be a teams uh, exam, right? So it will be face to face exam in this building. Good, okay. I'll see you tomorrow. What? Well, some of it will be here. I think we will reserve three or four classrooms. Mm -hmm. So it will not be this crowded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it will be. So I have a total of 130 students. So it's like 40, 40, 40. Should be enough.